Thank you to the entire team that's put together this symposium. And I very much appreciate the chance to come and, and talk with you. So I'm going to talk for the first half of my time about how did our current opioid crisis, which is of an enormous magnitude, develop? How did we get here? And then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk about opioids and the brain. How do they work in acute pain? Uh, what is chronic pain? And what is the role of opioids in treating chronic pain? Which I think is something we really don't understand very well, even though there's enormous prescribing for chronic pain. And then how do we understand opioids and addiction? So the poppy has been cultivated for many centuries. Uh, it's the source of opium. It's that thick liquid oozing out. Uh, was first cultivated in the cradle of civilization, uh, the Tigris and Euphrates River, by the Sumerians. And they, they cultivated crops, but also this plant they called the plant of joy. And it was used medicinally, it was used recreationally, and it was recognized to lead to major problems in early times as well. It was uh, traded wide and far. The Greeks used it in their medicine. Hippocrates wrote about it. Um, as morphine became a medicine that was available, uh, Dr. Osler, William Osler, sometimes called the father of medicine, said it is God's own medicine. And I, I learned, actually, in doing some reading, that that was because he had kidney stones and received morphine when he had kidney stones. And that's when he declared it God's own medicine. So it has an enormous benefit, and it is, I think, the most widely used medicine in the world still. And the opioid epidemic that we've gotten to today is a recapitulation. We've been in this place before uh, in the developments in the 19th century, when morphine was discovered by a German chemist, uh, there was commercial production of morphine and the beginning of uh, use as a medicine in a more uh, specific way, uh, the development of the hypodermic syringe. And it was God's own medicine when, in the Civil War, many soldiers had to have amputations, and it was like a miracle to be able to have morphine. But gradually, it also became clear that morphine and related products were becoming a big problem. They were marketed as medicines that were available over the counter, as well as by prescription. Um, when heroin was developed, it was to be a less addictive opioid compared to morphine. So it was developed by Bayer, and you could get heroin without a prescription. You had to have a prescription to get aspirin, but you could get heroin without a prescription. And you could get cocaine for your toothaches. The big pharma of that time were the chemistry companies. They were making enormous amounts of money. They wanted to have these products on the market, but the, uh, the states and the regulatory agencies began to realize what a big problem it was, and there was a big fight about uh, regulation of these products. Um, eventually, there was the Pure Food and Drug Act and then the Harrison Narcotic Act, which uh, was a real intense reaction to the widespread use of, uh, of opium and related products. There was a great deal of addiction in late 19th century America. Um, and the police and the ju uh, justice system began to prosecute addicts and also prosecute doctors um, who went to, to prison uh, if they prescribed to an addict. And the prescribing of opioids changed dramatically became much more restricted. Um, they were used in acute pain and end-of-life cancer pain, and that's how it was for much of the 20th century. And I think uh, the, the, mem the cultural memory of what happened in the late 19th century uh, was lost for a period of time. And then an interest in more aggressive and forward use of uh, opioids began with the hospice movement. 
So with the hospice movement, there was a great deal of attention to end-of-life care, to relieving suffering at the end of life. Palliative care physicians were advocating for the development of extended release opioids and advocating for continual use of opioids as opposed to as needed use of opioids, taking, they thought, a more preventive approach. And they became, began to become advocates for treating uh, difficult pain, not just in hospice patients, but in other patients. And simultaneously, there was some very bad research that was used to advance this argument that we could use opioids for uh, chronic pain safely. So this is a letter that appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's about 100 words. It was a letter that came out of one of the first uses of a medical database, and it was in the Boston area. And about 40,000 patients who were in the hospital were looked at in terms of did they develop an addiction? And they found four cases of reasonably well-documented addiction in patients who had no prior history of addiction. And the conclusion in the letter is that despite widespread use of uh, narcotic drugs in hospitals, the development of addiction is rare in medical patients with no history of addiction. So this very peculiar small study of patients in the hospital uh, began to be cited, and this is through the 1980s with a peak around the year 1999 or 2000, began to be cited over and over as evidence that prescribing opioids to individuals rarely resulted in addiction. And um, there was other research as well that was, that was poorly founded. Um, so this is a, a, a study of the chronic use of opioid analgesics and non-malignant pain, a report of 38 cases, uh, and Dr. Portnoy here was uh, head eventually of the American Pain Society, a great advocate for the use of opioids in chronic pain. And in going back and reading the paper he published, again, it's very striking when you look at the details in the paper that this became one of the articles cited as indicating that opioids could be used safely in chronic pain. Uh, it was 38 cases. Many of the individuals did not actually improve that much with chronic opioid use. And another striking aspect, uh, uh, as I read the paper, is that there was essentially no improvement in social uh, and work function for these patients. So, this was cited as a paper that using opioids to treat chronic pain was safe and was effective and should be uh, done more widely, but if you look at the details of the paper, the case really isn't there. Um, at the same time, the regulatory agencies, the professional agencies, um, agencies like the state medical boards and JCAHO started to get behind this idea that we should be, as a medical community, more aggressive in treating chronic pain. Uh, pain became the fifth vital sign, even though it's not something you can measure in the same way as other vital signs. Uh, educational material from JCAHO cited that there's no evidence that addiction is a significant issue when persons are given opioids for pain control. So going back again to Jick's letter, uh, to Portnoy's research, and it turned out that Purdue Pharma, who were the makers of OxyContin, and who were developing that product in the mid-90s, were funding a lot of these uh, entities. They were providing funds to state medical boards, providing funds to the American Pain Society, and um, became part of the wave of influence that got us thinking that uh, using opioids in chronic pain was safe and effective and it's something we should be doing more. It became such a, an imperative that state medical boards began requiring that physicians get education in pain management. You had to have those CMEs in your recertification by the state board.
And if you were under treating pain, and if that came to the attention of the state board, you could be sanctioned. So there was just an enormous um, movement toward uh, more aggressive treatment of chronic pain. And along with that, the development of a really remarkable advertising campaign. So Purdue Pharma was a company that was founded by the Sacklers, three brothers who were physicians. And if you want to read an interesting cultural and societal look at the Sackler family and the founding of Purdue and the development of OxyContin uh, in the most recent New Yorker, maybe one or two issues back, there's a long article about how the Sacklers are renowned around the world as funders of the arts, of um, medical uh, research, of medical facilities, and they're, they're looked at as great philanthropists. But the background of this family, if you go and look, is one where um, while they were developing OxyContin, they became aware of certain problems. For instance, that if the pills were crushed and snorted, they could be very powerful um, agents of a, a high from opioids. They were aware that even though they were marketed as a 12-hour interval product, people actually started to go into withdrawal after eight hours. And this was not information that um, was made public or acted upon. Um, the the, the um, founder of Purdue Pharma, Arthur Sackler, had a background where in the 60s, he developed the marketing campaign for Valium. And that was the most enormous uh, blockbuster drug uh, that, that was of that era. And he was just a marketing genius at figuring out how to um, market the products he made. So physicians were wined and dined, brought to conferences, and salesmen were sent out uh, with very detailed information and inaccurate information that they eventually got sued about, uh, explaining that this OxyContin would relieve pain in people who were suffering uh, greatly and would not lead to addiction. They cited that less than 1% of people would become addicted. And interestingly, if you look at where they went to market these drugs, it, was t it maps over where the opioid epidemic is the worst. So they went to the manufacturing uh, parts of the country, Appalachia, uh, places where people already uh, had high uses of pain medications and marketed very strongly in those areas. And this is a graph of what happened with uh, pharmacy opioid prescriptions uh, between 1991 and uh, 2015 or 2013 uh, with a tripling of opioid prescriptions. And this, um, the consequence of this was that a quarter of individuals began to misuse their opioid medicine, 10% became addicted, 6% of the addicted individuals changed to using heroin, and 80% uh, of heroin users started with pain pills. So people would get their pain pills, they would get larger and larger supplies, they would no longer be able to obtain them, and then heroin became very inexpensive, very easily available, uh, and people would switch to, to heroin. Well, here, here are the overdose deaths that parallel the uh, increase in prescribing. And, and this next graph really is, to me, one of the most striking. Uh, this is drug deaths in America from 1990 to 2015. And there's several things about this that are very striking. One is, um, at the right-hand side are other public health emergencies and the rates of death per year from those other public health emergencies, including deaths by gun violence, deaths by car accidents, uh, deaths from HIV illness, and this epidemic has now exceeded all of those in terms of its public health impact. The other striking thing about this um, curve to me is if you look at the rate of acceleration, um, it is still enormous and uh, has, has shows no signs of slowing down. Um, what, what is fueling the 
the worsening of this crisis at this point is the availability of heroin and now fentanyl. Uh, and fentanyl is 100 times or more as potent as heroin to the, the extent where police handling this on the streets sometimes are overcome and uh, just from, from touching it and getting a little bit of it in their, in their system. Here's a little more data. You can see that the opioid prescriptions are, um, are prescribed at the highest rate in uh, the upper Midwest, uh, down through Appalachia into the south, um, a little less so in the Mountain West and the West Coast. California actually is at the lower end of the rate of prescribing. If you look at the rates of overdose deaths, again, they're concentrated in the Appalachia area. Uh, within California, uh, it's more rural regions, just as it is across the country, that have the higher rates of overdose deaths. Santa Barbara is about in the middle of the state uh, in the rate of overdose deaths. And if you want to read uh, one book that will tell you about the development of this opioid crisis and all the different factors that uh, I'm telling you about briefly, it would be this book, Dreamland. Uh, this is a reporter for the LA Times who went out across the country and he initially began investigating the retail marketing of heroin because there were, there were individuals from a Jalisco part of Mexico who developed an expertise and, and an extended network of selling heroin in very small quantities and very conveniently. You could call somebody up on your cell phone they would deliver to whatever location you wanted. They would give you an extra balloon or two if you referred them a customer. And these, these individuals would go to methadone clinics and encounter people in the parking lots there to develop their customer base and became very successful in marketing heroin. So, so if you look at it all together, with the hospice movement and the advocacy of more aggressive treatment of pain, with the poor research that got behind the idea that we could treat chronic pain with opioids, with the adoption of uh, the fifth vital sign and regulatory agencies getting behind this endeavor, Purdue Pharma marketing, and then the availability of heroin becoming, uh, somebody called it the, the Walmart uh, evolution of, of heroin, becoming extremely convenient and easy to get. This has led to uh, the the graphs that, that you've seen uh, just prior to this. So, um, uh, another, an, another slice of this is that if you look at what's happening to middle-aged white Americans, the red um, line there, uh, in contrast to other countries, to other ethnic groups, the rate uh, of death among these people is increasing. And if you look at the bottom part of this graph, it's increasing from things like alcohol and drug poisoning, uh, chronic liver disease and cirrhosis, suicide. Uh, Bill Clinton's phrase was, middle America's dying of broken hearts. And I think, I think what you're seeing is that while the opioids are good acute pain medicines and then were thought to be good medicines for chronic pain, what what was neglected was that they not only cause analgesia, but they cause euphoria. So they, they are treating the reward system that Dr. Halpern was referring to. They're treating the emotional circuitry in the brain, and that's what's getting captured uh, uh, as people are taking these medicines for chronic pain that leads to misuse and uh, addiction. So, switching gears to a little bit about opioids and how they work in the brain. Uh, a, very, a very simple review that the brain has opioid receptors and we had medicines for those opioid receptors before we knew about them and the natural um, ligands that, that are attached to them. Uh, the mu receptor is the one that is most involved in analgesia, also in euphoria. Uh, there are also delta and kappa receptors and, and variants of these, of these receptors as well. 
One interesting aspect of the kappa receptor, which can induce dysphoria, feeling very bad, is that finding agents that can block this receptor are being investigated for treating depression. So if you can um, sort of reduce the stimulation of kappa receptors, uh, that may be a, a new avenue for treatment of depression. Opioid receptors are very widely distributed, brain, spinal cord, gastrointestinal system, periphery. And there are endogenous ligands that attach to these. Uh, we have a natural uh, system that will uh, provide some pain relief, um, uh, and uh, that's what morphine takes advantage of, um, is this system. So opiate effects uh, include clinical targets of analgesia, uh, cough, diarrhea, sedation, but they also have other effects emotionally. They elevate mood, they reduce anxiety, they reduce emotional pain. And how do, how do opioids work acutely? Um, so it, it's primarily in a descending tract in the spinal cord that uh, pain fibers from the periphery, when they're injured or when um, they release substance P, uh, uh, prostaglandins, other signals that uh, signal pain, uh, these fibers enter the dorsal horn of the spinal cord they synapse with second-order neurons that cross to the other side and go up the spinal thalamic tract. Uh, they eventually are relayed up to the thalamus and the somatosensory cortex, and that's how we perceive pain. And there are then signals from the thalamus, from the cortex, and other areas that go back to the periaqueductal gray area there, and that's where morphine is released. And, um, morphine disinhibits the descending tract that can influence the pain transmission uh, in the lower spinal cord. And the descending tract inhibits pain. Um, uh, the, nat the opioids um, can also act directly on the interneurons in the spinal cord, um, may act uh, to some degree on the pain fibers themselves. So the, the acute pain treatment that opioids provide is really not a central nervous system phenomenon, largely. Uh, there's some component of that, but they're most helpful in these uh, pain signaling tracks in the, uh, in the spinal cord. And this is just another view of that that um, I think better shows that these signals go up uh, to the midbrain, to the thalamus, to the cortex, uh, they're somatic uh, impact so you, you know where the pain is. There are um, emotional and motivational impacts so you have an idea of what to do about the pain. And there is a typical pain signal for acute pain uh, in, in the brain that is consistent. So um, there are somatosensory cortex areas that are activated. Uh, also anterior cingulate cortex and prefrontal cortex and thalamus. Uh, all of these are involved in acute pain perception and are uh, consistent and typical um, for individuals when they have acute pain. But what about chronic pain? Chronic pain has been approached as though it's a variant of acute pain. Um, so people complain of similar kinds of symptoms the thought has been that um, it may be somewhat different than acute pain, but it's related and probably quite similar to uh, acute pain. But in fact, as um, there are better studies and better understandings of chronic pain in the brain, it's something very different. And Dr. Jones uh, directed me to Hapkarian, one of the researchers here, who's done a great deal of research on chronic pain in the brain. And he's identified a number of different ways in which chronic pain differs from acute pain. Uh, chemically, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex has reduced N-acetyl aspartate, um, and there are other chemical changes as well. Cognitively, cr chronic back pain and chronic regional pain syndrome patients perform differently cognitively. 
they perform uh, poorly on emotional decision-making tasks, and they have attentional and memory deficits. In terms of the, the brain volume and density, uh, chronic back pain patients have decreased neocortical gray matter, decreased volume, and especially uh, in particular areas, uh, you can see there. Another quality that's different in chronic pain patients is that their pain fluctuates in very particular ways. And the patterns are consistent and characteristic for different kinds of chronic pain so that you can actually distinguish just from the spontaneous pain fluctuation pattern what kind of chronic pain somebody might have. And then finally, brain activity is um, altered in chronic pain. Uh, it's higher in the medial prefrontal cortex, which is an area the nucleus accumbens uh, uh, signals to. It's less active in the amygdala and ventral striatum. And when you look at chronic pain, each of these changes is different in different kinds of chronic pain. So if you look at post-herpetic neuralgia, osteoarthritis, chronic back pain, the signature in the brain is different for each of these conditions. So pain is not pain. Acute pain is not chronic pain, and chronic pain is not one entity. It appears to be um, a number of different entities. And his summary statements are that overall the brain activity patterns and changes in morphology and connectivity show a picture that more closely resembles the addicted brain and provides no evidence of increased sensory processing. So chronic pain captures the reward circuitry and the emotional circuitry in a way that's similar to addiction and, and alters uh, the person's experience in a way that's similar to addiction. Uh, the chronic pain changes, we hypothesize, reflect suffering and coping strategies that impinge on learning, memory, and the hedonics of everyday experience. The state of the brain's emotional and motivational circuitry determines the suffering and chronic pain. And the reorganization and representation primarily involve the emotional areas, the limbic and prefrontal brain circuitry, and minimally impinge on sensory properties of pain. And I, I, I was struck as I was um, learning about chronic pain, the similarities between chronic pain and addiction, as Hapgarian cites, and other articles cite with PTSD, where in each case there are acquired brain changes with neuroplastic changes, there's capture of the emotional limbic reward circuitry, there are persistent negative affects and suffering, and there's the inability to forget, to extinguish experience. And here's one, I think, um, particularly interesting study um, that Abkarian performed on looking at 39 patients longitudinally. So they had subacute back pain, and some people with subacute back pain go on to develop chronic pain, and other people get better and they don't have any pain. And he was interested in understanding what were the differences between individuals who went on to develop chronic pain as opposed to those who recovered. So he followed them for one year, did brain imaging each three months. And initially, all 39 subjects showed the typical pain matrix signature in the brain that acute pain patients have. So they showed brain activity that was altered in those, these particular areas, anterior cingulate, thalamus, and so on. Uh, eventually, 19, uh, I think for him it was fortunate that about half the patients got better and half didn't. <laughs> eventually, 19 patients recovered and exhibited no pain-relevant brain activity at one year. But 20 patients went on to experience persisting chronic pain. And this group displayed transformation in the brain with pronounced activity in other areas, such as the amygdala, medial prefrontal cortex, basal ganglia, and no sign of the previously robust activity in the acute pain-related areas. And then this was, this was particularly striking to me. These, these patients had, after one year, measurable reduced gray matter density in these particular areas, including the nucleus accumbens, 
and the connectivity between the nucleus accumbens and the medial prefrontal cortex at the start of the study predicted with 80% accuracy who would go on to develop chronic pain. So you could measure the connections between the nucleus accumbens, the medial prefrontal cortex, look and see that those patients who at the beginning of the study had the higher rate of connections were the ones who went on to develop chronic pain. So the conclusion he, he cites is that the main determinant of developing chronic pain is not the injury, but it's the person's brain. And I think this is similar in addiction as well. People with it, who do go on to develop addiction have a different starting point with their brain, just as these chronic pain patients do. I think it's similar also with post-traumatic stress disorder. Most people who are exposed to trauma, even severe trauma, don't develop post-traumatic stress disorder. But a, a certain percentage of people are vulnerable to developing it. And if you look at their brains, they have measurable differences. They have smaller hippocampi, for instance. And um, so, so in each of these cases, there's a, a brain difference and vulnerability that predisposes the person, in this case, to develop chronic pain. So, do opioids treat chronic pain? Um, I think the, the answer to this is, in part, it depends, and in part, we don't really know very well how opioids work in chronic pain. Some individuals are treated with opioids and the treatment is not very effective. Other individuals take opioids and they're impaired their functioning in their life is not as good when they're taking opioids. Other people develop tolerance and then they need to raise the dose of uh, opioids they're taking and sometimes keep raising the dose. And other patients develop hyperalgesia. And Tom and I were talking a little bit about this last night that hyperalgesia is, a, is an under-recognized consequence of opioid treatment of chronic pain where individuals become sensitized to feeling pain more intensely after treatment with opioids. And then in some cases, treatment leads to addiction, and those are the individuals who are typically ending up overdosing and dying, uh, but many others with uh, terrible addiction problems at a lesser level. And then there are some patients where treatment with chronic opioids is effective. And this is where I think it's very challenging for us as clinicians is, is to try to understand what is best for the individual patient. So um, here's an article in the Los Angeles Times last week by somebody who is a teacher in the University of California system who has uh, won an award as, uh, for excellence in teaching and who says, why do I feel like a criminal when I go into CVS? She has chronic pain, stage three neuroendocrine, neuroendocrine cancer. She's ha she continues to have radiation treatment, and she's in constant pain and tried uh, many, many different approaches to treating her chronic pain. And what works for her is to use some Vicodin. And it enables her to work, it enables her to function better. And she's now writing this article because She's afraid she's going to be thrown under the bus as we respond to this opioid epidemic. So that's, to me, one of the complexities of trying to understand this problem and trying to understand what to do is that some people are helped by uh, opioids for chronic pain. Other people develop, develop hyperalgesia. So this is a review article about opioid-induced hyperalgesia which is defined as a state of nociceptive sensitization, pain sensitization, caused by exposure to opioids. It's a paradoxical sensitivity, increased sensitivity to noxious stimuli. The findings of the clinical prevalence of opioid-induced hyperalgesia, at least in this article, are not available. How widespread this is, uh, it's hard to know, but it's clearly one possible path that happens when people are treated with opioids. It's thought to result from neuroplastic changes in both peripheral and central nervous systems that lead to sensitization. 
And there are many proposed mechanisms, uh, and, and they're actively being investigated, but the uh, glutenemergic system, the NMDA receptors, seem to play a significant role, um, and there are other uh, kinds of factors as well. So how about opioids and addiction? How does addiction fit into this? Um, addiction is a term that is surprisingly widely misunderstood. Uh, so when people develop a tolerance and they need to increase their dose of an opioid, some people say, well, now you're addicted. If people have developed a dependence uh, on an opioid and they're going to have withdrawal, if they stop it suddenly, other people will cite that as evidence of addiction. And if people develop hyperalgesia sometimes, they'll be told that they have an addiction. And none of these are addiction. They are qualities characteristic of the medicine, but they are not addiction. Um, I think I'll skip past this. So, so you know, opioids, as uh, in many other systems, as you influence the cellular mechanics, Opioids affect uh, adenyl cyclase, reduce cyclic AMP production. The cell, the cell adapts, starts to produce more in the presence of the opioid, and then when you take the opioid away, the cell is uh, overactive in producing cyclic AMP, and in the case of the locus ceruleus with opioids, you'll get the withdrawal symptoms. But addiction is something different. Addiction is an acquired disease of the brain that alters fundamental biologic processes that alter voluntary behavioral control. And the hallmark is the compulsive use of a drug or substance despite clinical and functional impairment with substantial loss of self-control despite the desire to stop taking the drug. So addiction may start as a voluntary hedonistic act. You like the high from trying opioids. But it changes to an altered brain that causes the loss of self-regulation. And the nature of addiction is that most people who use alcohol or drugs or opioids are not going to develop addiction. They may develop tolerance or dependence or withdrawal, but they don't go on to have addiction. About 8 to 10 percent of those with significant exposure will develop addiction. And what makes that 8 to 10 percent different? Uh, it's, as in the case of chronic pain, it's a different brain. Individuals who go on to develop addiction uh, have a different genetic makeup. They have an addiction history in themselves or their families. There are differences in their dopamine alleles. Um, they also are at risk if they have suffered adverse childhood events. And um, I recently read the Kaiser study about adverse childhood events. And if you haven't seen that, I would encourage you to take a look at it. And it's a look at measurements of rates of childhood adverse events, and then looking at medical and uh, psychiatric um, health later in life. And the results in this study are absolutely striking, uh, both in terms of medical problems and psychiatric problems. Trauma and PTSD predispose somebody to addiction, mood disorders, anxiety disorders, ADHD, uh, other mental health disorders predispose people. I work at our cottage residential addictions program and think that a third of the patients there who have significant addiction problems probably have attention deficit disorder. High impulsivity predisposes and high exposure at a younger age. Addiction hijacks the reward system. Uh, the, the, the same uh, system that Dr. Halpern was talking about, ventral tegmental area that projects with dopamine neurons to the nucleus accumbens which has projections to the prefrontal cortex. And then there are many other connections to the limbic system as well. Uh, that's what addiction takes over. So whereas somebody who doesn't go on to develop an addiction may be exposed to opioids and may experience some euphoria from them, they don't have a reward system that gets taken over in the same way. And this is just an uh, illustration that it's a wider system that connects to the amygdala extended amygdala limbic system. So how does addiction develop? It starts with binge and intoxication. After the intoxication, uh, individuals who are developing addiction experience withdrawal and negative affects. And then subsequently, 
they develop craving and anticipation of drug use. And the neuroplastic changes underlying addiction uh, include desensitization of the reward circuits. The reward circuits are altered. There's increased strengths of association and learning and conditioning to everything associated with the drug. So if you're in a particular neighborhood or seeing a particular person uh, or at the time of day when you would usually use, all of those things can evoke um, a craving for the drug. There's increased stress reactivity with increased cravings and there's weakening of executive functioning. Um, so the prefrontal cortex is involved. The desensitization happens after the initial euphoria with the opioid. Uh, the reward circuit is flooded with dopamine. Tolerance develops and the reward circuit resets. So individuals with addiction after a while will tell you the things they used to enjoy in life don't bring pleasure anymore. The reward circuitry has changed. There's a dampened ability to feel pleasure and motivation for usual life activities. The conditioned responses become very strong. All of the um, memory and learning that takes place around the use of the drug becomes hardwired so that the cues uh, lead to uh, beginning to experience the effects of the drugs. People can be exposed to cues for the drugs and start to experience the effects of the drugs because uh, the conditioned responses are influencing the reward system. So this leads to drug craving and anticipation. There's increased stress reactivity, so the limbic system also is remodeled. And, and individuals develop a dysphoric negative affect state and have heightened stress reactivity and lessened stress resilience. And they have increased cravings to try to obtain relief from this state. And then finally, the prefrontal cortex um, declines in executive functioning. So people make poor decisions, lose inhibitory control, lose self-regulation, and um, you'll commonly see individuals with addiction say sincerely that they want to stop and they're going to stop. And then they get into a situation that provides some cues, uh, re-evokes the craving, and their ability to use their executive functioning to manage themselves through that situation is impaired. So, briefly, the treatment of addiction involves all these different aspects. Stabilizing the neurophysiology, buprenorphine and methadone, are not simply substitutes for opioids, they're stabilizing the circuitry involved in opioids. Um, it involves treating anxiety, depression, and negative affect, rehabilitating self-care and social functioning, strengthening executive functioning, and allowing time for a, a kind of reestablishment of homeostasis in the, in the neural circuitry. And this is, this is one of the very difficult things in addiction treatment is, a, as a practical estimate, people need a year clean and sober to really develop the capacities again to manage themselves without returning to use.